Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here. We are broadcasting live on Zoom and Facebook Live on this gorgeous Saturday afternoon here at Frank Family Vineyards in Calistoga in the beautiful Napa Valley. And today, I'm Leslie Frank, and today I'm joined by our winemaker, Todd Graff, and assistant winemaker, Corey Garner, who are going to taste you through the Red Wine Lovers Tasting. Hi, guys. Hey there. Hi. We have uh, three of my favorite wines that we're tasting today. Uh, the RHF, which is our newest Cabernet Sauvignon, our uh, Rutherford, or not Rutherford, our, our Reserve Zinfandel, and our signature Winston Hill Bordeaux blend, which um, is just extraordinary uh, this year. And I'll leave all the technical uh, wine speak to the two experts, but for those of you who are watching at home, I want you to know that this is an interactive, fun, informal, hopefully somewhat educational tasting that uh, will take place for about an hour. Um, we welcome your questions and your comments, so please feel free to, uh, to send them to us and we'll get started. I'm going to pass it over to our two wine aficionados to talk about our newest release, the RHF. Uh, great. Welcome, everybody. I hope everybody's feeling uh, good and safe and healthy. Uh, thanks for taking some time out today. Um, again, uh, if you don't have these wines at home, open something. Open a nice bottle of wine and we'll just talk wine. We're not going to get into that much detail. So just, just uh, have a good hour, happy hour. Um, so the first wine, 2017 uh, RHF, named after Rich Frank, Rich Harvey Frank. Um, in his honor, it's 100% Rutherford. Last time we met, we did our Napa tier series. So wines from up and down the Napa Valley. Now we're going more Appalachian specific. So the first wines, all Rutherford, predominantly made up of our two vineyards, Winston Hill, which we've talked about in the past, but it's this great hillside vineyard in the heart of Rutherford. And then below that, across the creek is the Benjamin Vineyard, a valley floor piece of property that we own since 2012. And then there's a little of the Beckstoffer George III to blend in there also. Um, this is a Cabernet centric blend. So it's about 97% Cabernet, a little splash of Franc and Petit Verdot, um, but mainly Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's aged for almost two years in barrel and just being released right now. So this is the first look for many of us. Um, I'm looking at this wine. Uh, the 2017 vintage uh, was, was a tricky one. Um, it started out really nice, uh, but then we had a series of about five days over 100 degrees uh, around Labor Day and it got really hot. So we had to, we had to be careful of the fruit while it was so hot. And then also the biggest event um, of the 17 vintage were the big fires. Uh, this fruit was all picked the first week of October. So it came in before the fires of uh, October 8th. We are getting a lot of hellos from people across the country. And so we'll just do a little hello back. Uh, cheers, everybody from Austin, Texas. That's Greg Stein. Cheers, Greg. Uh, Sharon Nichols. Cheers from Illinois. Uh, let's see. Um, cheers from uh, Navarro Beach, Florida. Juan Porter, our good friend, and his lovely Joanna and sweet Sarah, their beautiful dog here in Napa Valley. Thanks for uh, Sarah's my favorite. tasting along with us. Um, Let's see, uh, Jen Frank, no relation, but uh, everybody who uh, supports Frank Family Wine is part of our extended family, I like to say. So they, they say hello from the OC in Southern California. And it's happy wine hour in South Bend, Indiana. Hello from Indiana and Mark and Jess at Lake of the Ozarks. Okay, have you, you guys have been binge watching the Ozarks. Just want you to know, Mark and Jess, I finished season three the other night and, and oh, I can't wait for season four, but I digress. Let's go back to the wine, shall we? Uh, let's see, we have a question here. Um, oh, 
for Christina Quillen. She said, I just joined, what are we starting with? Christina, we're starting with our newest release Cabernet called the RHF, which stands for Richard Harvey Frank, and all, also stands for Rutherford Hillside and Floor, which are the two vineyards that this wine comes from, our Winston Hill Vineyard and our Benjamin Vineyard, which uh, Todd and Corey have already discussed. So um, I like this wine. Um, we're gonna get to the Winston Hill in a little while, which is a Bordeaux blend, but we always talk about something called the Rutherford dust. So Corey, Todd, shed a little bit of light on Rutherford dust and what does that mean and what do we look for when we're looking for it? Shall I? You shall. Okay, um, so Rutherford dust was a uh, great term uh, coined by Andre Telechev um, back in the, the old days of when Napa Valley was first getting started. And it just meant that dusty, chalky character of the of the fruit there. And the valley floor definitely has that little chalkiness to the to the wines. Um, this wine's fun because it takes the Winston Hill piece that is more volcanic soil going off the valley floor, um, and plus the valley floor. So it's a blend of those two two components. Winston Hill is almost more similar to Pritchard Hill which is just over the, the rise uh, from the vineyard, but it is technically in Rutherford. Um, and then Benjamin, valley floor, um, more clay, loamy soils. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of comments here. I have somebody, Chris Hilton, He's, uh, he's emailing me and he's saying that we're drinking the 2014 Patriarch from Rutherford. Now we're not tasting the, the Patriarch today, but again, we're talking about that Rutherford dust and the Patriarch would definitely have that Rutherford dust. Um, that's great. The 2014, love that. Good vintage too. So um, what is it about this wine, Todd, that, um, you know, you're looking at the Hillside Vineyard, the, the, the Benjamin Vineyard on, on the floor, the, the combination of that fruit. Um, is one better than the other? I mean, we always hear, you know, this comes from the Rutherford bench. This comes from, you know, the, the, the hillside or higher elevation or what, what, what is the difference? Is one better than the other? So in our case, Winston Hill is a fantastic vineyard. It is uh, arguably top five vineyard in Napa Valley. So we're very fortunate to, to work with that fruit. Predominantly planted the Cabernet Sauvignon, but it does have Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc on it. Um, and And a little Sangiovese also, yes. Um, so that's a, a fantastic vineyard. That's where the Patriarch comes from, from two little blocks. Winston Hill, we'll talk a little bit later, has all the varieties except Sangiovese in it. Um, where again, this so you have that structure of the Winston Hill and then maybe the fleshiness of the Benjamin Vineyard. So you put them together, hopefully finding a perfect circle with the blend. And again, more balance, um, but, but great ageability. This, this wine's tasting great now, but uh, um, I'm thinking in 10 years, we'll be, we'll be loving it a lot. All right. Okay, so Todd and Corey, the two of you work uh, closely together, obviously. Todd is our winemaker and, and general manager here at Frank Family, and Corey is our assistant winemaker. Um, Corey, how, how much do you and Todd interact, agree or disagree? What's the process? What, this is what people at home really wanna know. Um, you know, do, do you sort of say to Todd, yeah, it tastes great, but I think we should add a little more of this, or I think it needs a little more of this barrel flavor. Or how does that process work? Well, Todd and I, we six feet apart is our, our closeness uh, level now with everything. Um, we, we have a joke in, in the winemaking department, and that includes our cellar master, Armando, and our enologist, Emily, where, where it's a democracy. And so we do blending trials um, all the time, and we all vote. And if it's a tie, Todd's the tiebreaker. So it's a democracy until he wants it a different way and then it's not. Makes sense. It's a democracy until it's not. I like that, okay. Uh, Tim Kosiak is asking, can you compare the 16 and the 17 vintages of RHF? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's great. Um, again, what, what we're ben the benefit for us is our consistency and our vintages, even though 16 and 17, we're, we're pretty different. Um, but we're using the same vineyards, the same grapes, the same blocks in those vineyards, the same barrel combinations. Um, and our end game is the same idea. We really want to get this well-rounded, structure, fleshy, Cabernet Sauvignon driven wine um, with some ageability in it. So, so you're going to see a, more similarities than you will with this wine than differences. Okay. Um, and Rick Johnson is asking what, sorry, Rick, you caught me in mid sip there. Uh, what makes a wine age better than the others? That's all. That's a question we get asked a lot, but it's a very good question. Tannin would be your, your number one ageability factor. Acid plays a little role in it, but tannin is the, the strongest one. Um, so you take, take a grape like Cabernet uh, Sauvignon, which is the predominant grape in both the RHF, the Winston Hill, and the Patriarch, and those tannins are really going to preserve that, that structure and, and, and a, just enjoyability of that wine. Um, for a lot of time, um, it will make those uh, young wines um, really, really tannic when you first drink them. Um, so if you are drinking the the younger vintages uh, like this one currently, um, the the difficult part is making the the current releases be drinkable when they're available, and also uh, finding the balance in them to to have enough tannin to really age well and drink it ten or fifteen years from now. So oh, I think you just answered the question that, um, let me pop myself back on screen here. Um, I think you just answered the question that Michael Cochran is asking. He's saying, when is the optimal time to drink the RHF? Is it five or 10 years? And it's really just personal preference, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, think of it as a bell shaped curve of aging, just like us as people. Um, the wines are going to rise. They're going to get better with time. Then they're going to plateau for a while. And then eventually they're going to start slowly falling off. Um, now that could be 10 years, could be 20 years, um, for depending on the wine. Um, but it is personal preference is the biggest thing um, that you can consider. I always recommend if you can buy multiple bottles of a wine you like, so you actually can watch that is the best. If, if, if three bottles is in your budget, buy three bottles, drink one in five years, one in eight years, and one in 12. I'm making up numbers, and you'll see what you like. Um, that doesn't take, a, it's not a 12-year experiment, but you'll kind of see. Do you, was it still a little early? And was 12 maybe a little too late for you? Then you know you'd like them a little bit more. Or when you're at a restaurant, when the restaurants open back up, see if you can find a 10-year-old wine to, to buy. Or in a wine shop, they probably have them right now, actually. It's probably a great time try to dig in some wine shop cellars and, and buy a 10 year old wine and see if you like that. You know, it's interesting. So a couple of weeks ago, and I think those of you who are watching today who are on our email list and, and in our wine club, uh, you probably got the email, but we opened the cellar and it was our Rutherford Reserve uh, 2010. And we put that up, we went into the library and we put that up um, for the day and we actually sold out of it, but we had some, and Todd, you had tasted it recently and we were talking, we have, we're having this conversation about a 10 year old wine and we were saying how, how great it was. And um, you know, you, you realized that we actually had some of that in the library. So we decided that, okay, well, we'll, we'll put it up and we'll see if, if anybody's interested. And obviously there are people out there who are interested in drinking you know, the wines that, that have a little bit of age on them. And what's great for us is that we realize that our grapes really do hold up. I mean, you can lay this baby down in the cellar for 10 years, 15, maybe 20 years, you know. I'm too impatient. I'm not waiting 15 or 20 years. You know, I'm, I'm always opening the current vintages and I know that drives you too crazy that I do that. But, you know, I like to, I like to taste what we've, just released and I'm, I'm always really happy with it. And then, you know, I go back and I taste it, you know, a year or two later and it's still fantastic, even better maybe. And, um, but yeah, it, it's great to see how our wines age. And, and, you know, we're talking about Rutherford fruit right now and that fruit has um, not exactly a wine term, but it has staying power, I would say. So 
So cheers to that. So yes, and and the worst thing you can do is age too long also. So it, it's it's a fine balance. So don't buy a bottle of wine and stick it away for 40 years expecting for some great occasion. Tuesday nights are great occasions. So open them. Um, you know, sitting at home right now cooking, everybody's probably getting getting better at cooking. So uh, open a nice bottle of wine. Um, and when, when Corey was talking about the tannins, part of our job, it, it's either like making your morning coffee or your tea. You're trying to extract all this great flavor from the grapes. And it's all about a balance and a fine line again. Extract too little, it's not going to age too much. You extract uh, too well. If you extract too much, then it's going to be awkward when it's young. So it's finding that fine line of ex just enough extraction to have ageability, but attractiveness like this does right now. So I guess I was talking about the, uh, the library wines that we offered uh, recently, and I, I've got a question here from Dennis Chachewski. Dennis, yes, can you purchase library wines? The answer is yes. Now, um, if, if you're on our email list, and I'm assuming you are because you know about this webinar that we're doing right now, um, just keep an eye uh, in the next couple of weeks because we are offering some, some library uh, wines to our, our email list and, um, and you know, this, this whole shelter in place has given us the opportunity to kind of go into the cellar and see what we have that um, is, is drinking beautifully and that we can offer. Of course, these are always limited because we don't keep that many behind. We typically sell out of, of what we make, but um, we will go back in the cellar and see what we can find. And the answer is yes, you can purchase those and you can always contact us at, at, uh, at the winery too if you have any specifics that you're looking for. Um, Dennis is also asking, what's the ageability of Zinfandel versus Cabernet? And we'll get to that in a minute because we are going to taste our um, reserve Zinfandel today. But while we're still talking about the RHF um, and Cabernet, I want to um, pose a question by uh, Bob who says, he's drinking the 2014 reserve Cabernet from Calistoga, which is a wine club wine that that you made um, for specifically. How does the Calistoga fruit vary on fruit? So if I, if I heard you correctly, if I, if I heard you correctly. How does Calistoga fruit vary from Rutherford fruit? Great. So um, Calistoga, so, um, Cal we're having a little uh, feedback. Um, feedback. Um, Calistoga fruit is at the northern end of the valley. It's the hottest part of the valley, where Rutherford's right in the heart of it. Um, the Calistoga wine is a little bit more linear, has this natural acidity to it. It's on the eastern side of the valley floor, um, and, and, and more a little more focused fruit than broader fruit like Rutherford. Um, so we really like that one for aging a lot. I do anyway. Todd, I love this question. And we hear, we hear comments and sometimes complaints from the sommeliers in restaurants. Why does the winery use wax on certain wines? Well, <laughs> um, we don't wines, but why don't we share the secret of opening those without uh, having a difficulty? So the technical reason is because Rich and Leslie want that. Um, that's the technical reason. Um, but it's, it's very simple to open, actually. Um, the bottle here, the wax, um, especially the reds. We use a softer wax if possible. If it's cold, put, give it some body heat for a little bit and soften the wax and just go right through it, and you have no issue. Um, Chardonnay, on the other hand, sometimes you pull it out of the refrigerator it is a little more brittle after it's cold, and it will chip, but um, uh, but it's it's fine. Just go right through it and pull it out. If it chips, I'm, we're sorry. Um, you got to pick something up off the floor. <laughs> okay. Well, we've talked about the RHF, and I want to move on to um, another wine that is about to say it's one of my favorites. I mean, that just. Do I sound like I have a problem when I say that? Because they are kind of all my favorites. Um, 
every wine has its place, right? And whether you're celebrating something or it's a Tuesday night or you're having that wine with a specific um, meal, whether it's a steak or it's pasta or it's a spice food or whatever, every wine has its, has its moment. Um, the zinc is just kind of, it's what Rich and I call our go-to wine because it just goes any night of the week. Um, it is two bottle wine. Um, I'd like the two of you to talk about that first, um, <laughs> about the, the, the reserves in, where it's from, what the characteristics are, and how it compares to the, the, the beautiful big Cabernet that has great grippy tannins that we just tasted. Uh, this uh, Reserve Zin, uh, it's from Chow's Valley is its AVA. So you're gonna find that just east of Napa, um, Napa proper, still in Napa County. Uh, it's gonna be a 10% Zinfandel, uh, sorry, excuse me, 90% Zinfandel, 10% Petite Syrah. Um, and the, my favorite thing about this wine is it's just, no matter what vint which vintage you're drinking, it's just very, it's round, it's balanced, it's, it has a lot of fruit to it. It still keeps its structure without being a fruit bomb. So with, with Zinfandel, also, you get more red fruits, a little more spicy black pepper there is traditional, uh, where the Cabernets that we're bookending here will be more black fruits. Um, and with the question on aging, um, I actually like my Zinfandels a little, you know, within five years. Mm -hmm. I, I like them to be the fruit that, that it's given to it, the natural fruit that the Zinfandel has. Our style is not to make a port style wine. This is um, very balanced. It's got nice acidity. Um, we want you to drink the whole bottle, uh, not just one glass and the, at the ski resort. So um, uh, the alcohol is in balance. Um, with Petite Syrah that Corey had mentioned, um, you've got to walk, I keep using this term fine line um, or balance. Too much Petite Syrah will make it taste like Petite Syrah. We don't want to do that. We make a Petite Syrah and we love that. Uh, we want to make it taste like Zinfandel, but the Petite Syrah adds a little structure into the wine and a little, and a little depth of color too. So it, it's a great blending varietal, but if you use too much, it becomes more Petite-like. Uh, and this is fun for us. Um, I mean, making all these wines are fun. So we, we get to make all these different styles. Uh, where Zinfandel differs for us, we use uh, French oak, 100%. Our whole house is French oak, uh, but Zin too. So uh, a little more unusual, I'd say, for most of California. Uh, and we use Burgundian barrels. So it's, uh, it's got a nice little light toast, light smoky character from the barrels. You know, Ridge Crank, my husband calls this his two bottle wine. And the reason he does that is because he loves to, so his thing is this wine goes perfectly with anything that you grill. And the reason it's a two bottle wine is because you drink one while you're grilling and then you drink one when the grill's ready and you're eating dinner. So Rich is up at Winston Hill today and I don't know if he's watching. I'm not sure what he's doing. If he's, hopefully he's grilling something good. Um, and ready. I am home. Well, hey there, Mr. Frank. Um, well, I can't see you, but hello, welcome. Um, I didn't realize he'd be grilling in the middle of a 90 degree day and it is warm and I am covered here, but um, what do you make? Well, on my first of my two bottles of uh, Zinfandel, and I don't know if Laura can get the shot, but I've got a couple of racks of ribs getting uh, getting grilled here. Um, and um, I've always talked about this being a two bottle uh, <laughs> thing that I do with the uh, with the ribs. My feeling has always been that anything that hits a grill, whether it's ribs or chicken uh, or a steak. Once it marbleizes, it goes great with the Zinfandel. A lot of, it doesn't have as much tannins as uh, a Cabernet would have, and it's got a little more fruit to it, at least on my palate, 
And I just love the match when you put them together with different sauces that you like. And uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. So I'm just out here while you guys are enjoying yourself back there. And uh, I'll let you go back to that. Unless you have any questions. I, I'll, uh, I noticed that the apron says sous chef rich. It should actually say grill master rich. Oh, uh, are you, can we get another shot of those ribs? Yeah, they're just getting started. I no, mean, the no, no, no. we're going to check back with you. Just getting started. Yeah, the king ribs, which I will say to everybody, is not the sauces, etc., or the um, it's it's technique really. It's the key is cooking slowly and adding your sauces later. So the beginning part is to have patience, which many of us don't have, and I've learned this over the years. Just slow cooking after you put on various rubs that you like and hold off on uh, the sauces because they have a lot of sugar in them generally and they burn. So I'll just keep on working away here. I'll keep on drinking. Hope I'll be in good shape to talk to you as the show moves on. <laughs> okay. Do you think he'll save us some ribs? That would be great if he would. If we could get together, I'll send them to everybody in a separate band. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Kid. Hi, Erin. We know Erin well. She's been on many of our, of our Frank family cruises. Um, we miss you, Erin. We, uh, we hope you and, and, and your friends, your girlfriends get out uh, to Napa when um, the shelter in place is lifted and we can start seeing guests again. She's asking, uh, what is the difference between the Reserves Inn and the Napa's Inn? Good question. Great question. Hey, Aaron, how you doing? I hope you're uh, fine. It's good to hear from you. Um, so with the Napa Zinn, it's the Napa Valley we're, we're taking advantage of. So from northern uh, Napa to Calistoga and everywhere in between, we are farming Zinn. Uh, we're taking some from Rutherford, uh, um, a, a vineyard that was planted in the 50s in Calistoga, one that was planted in the 50s in St. Helena. So we're going all around the, the valley and sourcing fruit. And um, with the reserve, it's only Child's Valley. So, and that's a sub appellation that we think does a really good job with Zinfandel. Um, and it's actually one family, uh, the Nicolini family. They have long history here. And since it's uh, the cousin, the Phil Sinceri joined. So there's Joe Nicolini, Phil Sinceri, their cousins. They've split up the property. Um, but it's the original piece that they had, and we get a little bit from each of them. And then we do a barrel select of the best of the best for the reserve. And um, uh, we think it's just a little more concentrated um, than the, the Napa Valley blend. Okay. Um, Roger Carlisle, um, who's had a question here before, he, he says that he does agree with the two bottle view of the Zinfandel. And um, he also says that about the Sangiovese. That's a two bottle wine too. So I, no disagreement there. Um, Jude Estuder, and I apologize if I'm saying it correctly, but Jude um, is tasting the reserve sand right now and says that it is delicious. Um, and we have another guest who is, says he's drinking the 2014 reserve Zin. Is it the same blend and region? same region, yes. Blend may vary from year to year. And, and maybe we can talk about the blending aspect of it and how that does change from vintage to vintage. Okay, so the blending, what, what's fun for us, anyway, we, we live with these wines for two years, approximately. Uh, the Zin, closer to 18 months. But we live, and we're tasting them regularly. We're looking at them every month, at least. And we get to know them. We're, we start getting to know their personalities. We know which ones have the focus we want. We know it has the fruit, it has the tannin, the structure maybe. So we're getting to know that, and we're, we're, for better terms or not, we're ranking them and we kind of uh, know who our A students are versus our B students. Um, so the blending process is, is, takes 18 months, even though we're not doing it every day, it's, it's an evaluation process of looking at it. Um, and when I say it's not as simple as when I say Child's Valley and Nicolini and Sinceri, but we buy five, six blocks from that family of different vineyards, slightly different clones on different rootstocks, 
different planning dates. And we keep them all separate and just keep evaluating and evaluating. And then what's fun for us is we get to make a decision eventually that this is what we think makes it special. And we put it in a bottle. Well, and the, to add to that, the, the great thing is it's, we're not, it's not like baking. We're not going by a formula. We don't have to have the 10 per, because we did 10% petite straw this year, we don't have to have it for the next vintage. If we, we can do what tastes best and that you may have those, those different vintages have different characters that, that we can make maybe next year is 8% petite straw because that's what tasted better. We don't have to stick with the formula. We can, we can do what, what tastes best and what we like best and what our consumers will like best. And Corey, it's a question that I've heard um, many times. What is the toughest wine to make? Or you, what, what is the most challenging wine for you to make? Is it, is it a blend or is it a 100% of a varietal? The, I would say the sparkling is the toughest to make because it's a lot of algebra involved. A lot of algebra to get it perfect. So, so that's the toughest. That makes all the others look easy. And speaking of sparkling wine, uh, for those of you who are so inclined to tune into us next Saturday, uh, same time, same time, same place, uh, we will be doing our sparkling wine virtual tasting and we'll taste through the four sparkling wines uh, that we produce here at Frank Family. Um, it's, it's very much... Uh, just a passion project, I think, for all of us. We're all sparkling wine lovers. It is a tip of the hat to the history of our property, which we purchased at a time that prior to that, it was the Hans Cornell Champagne House. And we kept on with the tradition and Todd, your experience uh, working for, for other uh, wineries that produce uh, bubbles. Uh, I know that it's one of your favorite things to make. And um, so for those of you who are Bubbles lovers, please tune in next uh, Saturday where we'll be talking about Bubbles and, and the complexity and the algebra that goes along with, uh, with making delicious sparkling wine here at Frank Family. Um, another question that we have uh, from a, an anonymous attendee who, who is asking about decanting. And that's, that's something that I, I always go back and forth on. You know, I think, oh, it's an older wine do I decant the older wine? Do I decant the younger wine? It's, I never really know when I should be decanting it, if I should be decanting it. Is decanting uh, always a good thing or at times can it be a negative when it's talking about wine? Personally, for me at home, the, the younger wines, like the, the current releases we're drinking now, I prefer to decant them. I add a little, you know, it's, it's the difference of when you, when you first pour your glass of wine, if you haven't decanted, and you come back to it 30 minutes later because you get distracted and it tastes completely different. So for the younger wines, I personally prefer to decant them um, and, and introduce that air as you're pouring it, get that the bubbles and the, the air introduction there. Uh, for the older wines, I, I do sometimes decant them as well, but more to keep the sediment in the bottle and not, um, not end up with that gritty texture in the glass. Um, I think decanting is a, a personal preference more so. I, I also don't discriminate against a newer wine that hasn't been decanted. Uh, and, Sorry, Todd, go ahead. No, no, so exactly what Corey was saying. You know, decant, it's very simple. Um, decanting, you could pour the glass before dinner starts and leave them out or pour three. I like to watch the evolution. So mm -hmm. I pour it, I smell it, I come back. Um, you can open it and leave it out. We're not as patient as you, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're known for your patience yeah. around here. <laughs> Wait, I got a trap door here. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, so it, it does, you don't have to buy expensive equipment. You can you transfer from one bottle to another. We all have nice, we don't all maybe don't have nice glass decanters, but you can get you can get a pitcher and pour it in and pour it out. So it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be uh, gadgets. A large um, drinking glass can be a decanter. Yes. Yeah, so air reading the wine. Yeah. Just be like bring air into it or, or keep the, uh, the per se, the coffee grounds out of your glass. So it's, um, so you should do it for both for different reasons. Um, since we're tasting the Zinfandel, can we talk a little bit about 
California's Zinfandel because I know that it's sort of a misunderstood grape, if you will. Um, it, it's you you taste some Zinfandels that are that are overly fruity. It's the big fruit bomb. Um, you know, there was many 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 years ago the the the, the day where we all drank the white Zinfandel, um, which we probably don't drink today, and it's just kind of one of those things that people don't really get it. How do you explain it and how do you turn somebody on to a Zinfandel? I mean, I know when they come to the winery, when our guests come to the winery and they taste it, they go, oh my God, it's, it's delicious. But when you're explaining a Zinfandel and trying to talk about that, how do you make it appealing or, or sell it to somebody that, that may have had a bad experience with an overly fruity, big alcohol Zinfandel? Um, so I think you have to taste it. Zinfandel, it has had a roller coaster history. I mean, I consider it California's heritage grape. Um, it's what the immigrants brought first and, and made successful here in California. Um, Zinfandel on itself isn't that dark of a grape. So when you see a really, really black one, it, it, Zinfandel clusters are about the size of a football. <laughs> And one grape ripen, the one grape could be super ripe and another grape could be underripe. And the whole cluster looks like that. So you're all, with, with Zinfandel, you're really taking an average. So what we make sure when we sample, we do clusters so we can get a better idea of that. But it's, and then it's the early days, they had other varieties planted in the same vineyard. So they had these field blends. Uh, with these other darker colored grapes. And when it came in, it looked really dark. But if you really look at Zin, it's, it's not the darkest of grapes. Um, so we, we tr strive to have that typicity of Zinfandel, what a true Zinfandel should taste like, even though we do put a little petite Syrah on there for the history and the structure. Um, uh, so then we had the, the, the white Zinfandel phenomenon. So if you ask some people, they think Zinfandel is a white grape. Um, but I think we're over that period of time now where it is a beautiful red grape. Um, it's very easy to pick all these grapes super ripe. That's really e an easy decision. Just leave it out there until it's overripe and pick it. Um, and it's very easy to pick it under ripe. You know, just get it early. It's very hard to pick it just right. And that's what we're trying to do with ours in is, is pick it just right. So there's acidity and flavor in there and structure, yes. This is an interesting question. Kim Elson is asking, do winemakers have house strains of yeast? Does yeast type impart flavor on a wine? Corey, I'm gonna direct that one to you. So that's a... There's so many answers to that question because every winemaker is different. So your your house strain of yeast is is your preferred one as as a winemaker. Um, whether you use a, a wild fermentation or a natural fermentation or whether you use a, a commercial isolated strain. Uh, personally, we prefer the isolated strains because they're they're more controlled. They don't give off um, questionable aromas that can happen at times with the the wild ones but also because we've used those commercial ones if we were to have a wild one that would also be what is living in our cellar so so we we do and i say we todd has his before i I've, I've been here todd has his preferred strain um that we use for each varietal and there's and there's different reasons for them um different yeasts and, mm -hmm. and we use a different i have a different we have a different house favorite for each varietal. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one blanketed uh, yeast. Um, so the Zinfandel gets a certain one, the Cabernet gets, and we don't use it 100%. We use uh, predominantly, but we always do experiments every year of something else to keep mm -hmm. looking. But the Cabernet has a specific one predominantly, the Zinfandel, the Chardonnay, etc. And And Dennis, uh... Gajewski, and I apologize, Dennis, I don't know if I'm saying your name correctly. Um, he, he's asking, what is the definition of old vine Zinfandel? When we talk about old vines and we hear this thrown around a lot, what does that mean exactly? Um, I have no idea. It means nothing. Uh, yeah, um, so <laughs> no, um, uh, nothing. We, joke, we joke about that a lot. Um, 
Is it 50 years? Is it 100 years? Um, is it older than the one next door? Um, so there is no defined legal term. No for regulation that. on yes. it. And Anne Nguyen, Anne, hello from Chicago. I love this question. Um, she said for the rookies, and nobody's a rookie because honestly, there is no, I like to say there is no bad question. Um, you know what you like if you drink it and you, and you enjoy it, then it's a good wine. There is no right or wrong answer here. But her question is, could you please explain what you mean when you say structured? What does that mean? Great. Um, so uh, think of it, uh, structure, uh, the framing of your house, uh, the, your skeleton of your body. You, you need the bones to, um, to have uh, or the, the frame to build on it. So you want a nice structure so it's, it's not fat and flabby, it's not lean and thin. Um, you, you know, that you can add some muscle to it or some body to it and it will hold up. Um, yeah, I, now that you say that, it's like, how do you explain that? <laughs> Even though I've been saying that for 40 years, it's like got nice structure. So um, he's referring to, to the, the mouth feel, um, yes, of course, it's, it's when it's in your mouth. Um, it's how does it feel? Does it just kind of lay there and not excite you? You know, you're, you, you generally get acid more on the side of your mouth. If it's a flabby wine, what we call flabby means it's lower in acid and it just kind of hangs there limply um, when you're when you're moving it around in your mouth. And a structured wine is gonna gonna give you all those characters. It almost it feels like it it has shape in your mouth. It's not just sitting there just a like water would or or you know something a juice. It it has this this 3D shape in your mouth when you're moving it around. What's really important for us is texture. So um, we, I mean, obviously you, you see a wine, you want to catch it, up with you. You want it, yeah, where's more of the wine? I need more wine. Jeez. Waiter? Yeah. Garçon. Um, but um, yeah. Oh, but you're way over there. It, I got it my bottle to myself. It, it pays to own the winery. Um, yeah, um, so. Uh, Would you so like I, this back yeah uh, um what's your flavor we're gonna be moving on to the winston you you got a little winston there but you you want to you want to revisit the zinfandel there todd sure i'm a slow learner but save the best for last but yes we like to to revisit so obviously when you're tasting you look at the color you can't help but see it and you 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 get to you put it towards your mouth and you you smell the aromatics you want that but Texture is really important. How it fills fills your mouth, how it finishes. You you don't want it to finish as soon as you're done tasting it. You want it to last. Um, here, you want to do a cameo? Thank you. Okay, Todd. Todd's happy. He's got his own bottle there. Um, I'm sharing. We're a team. But you know, we talk about teamwork is dream work, Leslie. But it's also about balance. And I mean, I know we throw these terms around, but but. It, it, it really is true. I mean, you, it's about the tannins. It's about the fruit. It's, it's about, um, you know, the texture of the wine and all these things come into play and, and you've got to have balance. You can't have, you know, too heavy a tannin and not enough fruit or, you know, too much, too much fruit and not enough tannin to support that. So it's really a balancing act. And what the two of you do is it's, it's a science, but it's an art. And I think that- Science art. <laughs> what was that? Science, science art. And yeah. art. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, I'm, it, Corey, seriously, really? I mean, come on. Um, okay, so- I deal with on a day to day. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's about the perfect balance. And it's sort of like that when you're grilling as my husband rich would tell me that it's really about the balance and timing and patience and the right seasoning and the and you know the right sauce on on the barbecue and the right temperature and all of those things come into play to balance and make the perfect dish so i'm hoping that rich is still grilling those ribs and we can check in with him 
and see how that's coming along because because I'm a little bit jealous that he's up there drinking, 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 drinking. How's it going there, husband? Okay, he's still on the first bottle, but you're we're not doing you very well. We're not in the house yet, so I still have a little time. To um, maybe Laura can get a quick shot of uh, uh, Laura. Our, oh, uh, what, do, what have you? What else do you have on there? You've got some. Are those sweet potatoes or yams or what are we seeing? Yeah, I. What I do is I like to take yams. Uh, not hearing you. We're not hearing you. Okay, I like to take yams and put them in a microwave for six, seven, eight minutes till they get a little softer, then slice them. And when I get towards the end of the barbecue, uh, put them on there. They grill beautifully. And it's a great side dish because it gives a little bit of sweetness with the ribs when you take them off and cut them up. I also have here a couple of actual, I don't know if Laura can get these, but uh, potatoes you want. Oh, baked potato? Well, it'll yeah, be awesome. I, will, I will take a little on those I will take a little bit of really good olive oil and uh, I also put those in the microwave and put those on just at the end and it makes it crispy like a french fry um, and that's sort of fun with this and if Laura turns around she can see I've already got my sauces sitting out okay you got your sauces that's great I may have the uh, I may have the uh, Oh, Laura, go back. Show the beautiful. You going before you get here? I was trying to say. And Laura, I think, is taking a picture now of actually. That's Winston Hill, which is just really starting to bloom. You can see all the uh, the leaves coming out. All of the vines are really putting out uh, oh, beautiful shoots now. And it's uh, aside from being a little warm for this time of year. It is definitely it's just, warm. Uh, a beautiful day out here. Yeah. It's um, Rich, I'm assuming that your plan is to share those ribs. I'm going to. I just want to say, this is our pizza oven. One of these days, we'll do one with uh, making pizza out here also. Okay, fantastic. All right, how much are we going for pizza? How much, how much Zinfandel do you have? I have the other okay. bottle waiting for you to open together. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay. Yes. How lucky am I? Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. Okay. Well, we just saw Winston Hill, and I think that would be the perfect time to segue into our Winston Hill wine. And Corey, Todd, take it away. Tell us about the Winston Hill. Winston Hill is, is my favorite wine, so that's it's easy to talk about. Um, I I love this wine because it's a it's a Bordeaux blend. It's always predominantly Cabernet, but it's it's unique character for me is that I enjoy it when it's really young and I enjoy it, you know, how many my favorite current vintage right now is 2006. Um, the 2004 is still drinking great. So it, it has this ageability to it, um, but also it's a Bordeaux blend. So we add a Petit Bordeaux, a Cab Franc, and a little bit of Merlot in it, and it, it softens it up and it, it just, it makes it so drinkable from, from release to, to 15 or more years down the road. Um, I always say this is, this is my favorite wine, whereas the, the Patriarch, for example, is it's, it's, sibling uh the patriarch i want to have with my steak you know it, it's 100 percent cabernet you have those those uh big tannins and big structure and i want those with a nice fatty ribeye um just just that that food wine the winston hill is my go-to for just the the you can have it while you're cooking with no food you can have it during your meal and it'll it'll still stand up to those high fats and then you can still drink it afterwards um, without those. I, it's my favorite. Uh, it's a classic Napa Valley wine. The, the, where we go now, we're a single vineyard here now. Winston Hill, we've talked about, and it's really hard to, to describe how fantastic this vineyard is. If you've ever been to Napa, you drive up the highway, you see the, the top part of it, you drive on the Silverado Trail, you see the lower part of it, but it's a three-tiered 
a vineyard. Um, and again, volcanic rocky soil. It's naturally terraced over time. Uh, the rocks stand out. We do, we do irrigate this vineyard because it's all rock, but the water just visits. It doesn't really stay there. It just kind of passes by, touches the root, touches the root and goes. Um, so uh, concentration, balance, it's, it's natural farming. This, this vineyard, we don't really have to do a lot. It's, it's, it's embarrassing that we don't have to do that much in the vineyard to this, except just let it grow. It's, it doesn't overproduce. Um, we do have to farm it to keep some shade on it because it, it's got great sun exposure. Um, but you see this concentration of fruit. If anybody has a Woodson Hill open, you'll see the constant concentration of fruit, black fruits, the nice length. Drink, take a sip, and then count to 10, and you're still tasting the wine. Um, it's just a fantastic wine to make. And we get to have fun with it because there's no, there's no recipe again for this. We call it a red wine blend. So, um, so some years, if we want to use more Merlot or more Cabernet Franc and less Cabernet Sauvignon, we can. We can do whatever we want in this. Um, so super fun to make. It's our flagship wine. It, and it's probably my favorite also. So Philip Johnson is asking, and I, I suppose we could have tasted, or you still can, uh, taste the RHF beside the Winston Hill. He's asking, what are the different grapes that go into the two Cabernets? Obviously, we know Cabernet Sauvignon, but what are the other grapes? Which of the other grapes makes the biggest difference? So Cabernet is king. Cabernet Sauvignon is king. So it has the most impact. Um, Merlot is a sibling of Cabernet Sauvignon, but a little softer, a little lighter, a little, a little brother maybe, um, if, you, if you would uh, give me that example. Um, Cabernet Franc may be the sister sibling, a little more floral, a little more feminine, um, very pretty, um, not very muscular. Um, Petit Verdot, on the other hand, is pretty dark and brooding. And uh, so it's a family and there's one of each basically. So uh, four siblings, Cabernet being the, the, the biggest, um, the biggest uh, best structured, best body, um, physically uh, the big one. And then you have the little brother, the sister, and, uh, and then the little tough guy is Petit Verdot. So, so we, yeah, go ahead, Leslie, sorry. No, no, finish up. No, no, so we typically, Cabernet Sauvignon is, is the classic, it's, there's a reason it's the king of reds globally, not just in Napa, but. Well, and it has key components of all the other varieties as True. well. It, yeah. it, it has little pieces of all the other varieties that, that can. The, the, the funny part is as, as you get into family talking and now I'm just BSing through time, you know, the parents <laughs> of Cabernet Sauvignon is Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So you have a sister and, a, and an herbal white, and that those two made Cabernet Sauvignon, who became this big king. So it was great. So this is interesting. Uh, Dennis wants to know, how do we compare the Winston Hill Vineyard with Mount Veeder? Now, obviously, two, two different locations, but both, um, you know, hillside fruit. So there is definitely a difference. And, and that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and kind of very easy to answer. So um, Winston Hills on the eastern side, the Vaca range, so the sun comes up from the east and then it spends most of the day up top and then goes west and, it, and is hitting Winston Hill throughout the whole day. Mount Veeder is on the, on the Mayakama range and it's up in the hill. And it's a little more, it's a higher elevation vineyard for us. And it's a little cooler climate and it's a later ripening vineyard too. So it's got this hillside, but late ripening issue going on. So, uh, <laughs> so night and day, even though, and that's the, it's the hardest thing to explain to somebody when you say Napa Valley, well, is this vineyard and that vineyard must be the exact same. No, you drive, the difference between Winston Hill and Benjamin, which is, as Richard and I joke a lot, is a, is a, is a par five from each other. Um, they're night and day vineyards. So, um, 
and you have different aspects of sun. You have the microclimate, you have different soils. The, the, the interesting thing about Napa Valley, it has almost all the soil groups, in the, well, almost all the soil groups in the world. It's a Mediterranean climate. So we, we, we've got a lot going on. So just because, so we try to talk in rule, a general rule of thumb. So everything, there's always, uh, everything's a little different as you, as you move into more detail. Juan Porter says he's drinking the 98 Winston. Wow, that's incredible. He says it's stunning. His words, stunning. Thanks, Juan. Uh, we appreciate your support over all these years. And uh, thanks for, for tasting along with us today. Um, I have a question. Someone, one of our viewers is, is uh, slow cooking pork shoulder. Any recommendations for wines that pair best with, with our wines that, that pair best with pulled pork? And my answer would be, all of the above. All the ones that we're tasting today would go beautifully with the pork shoulder. And before we wrap it up, because we've got a few more minutes, I want to know how those ribs are coming because um, I'm going to be heading home shortly to Winston Hill and I'm hoping that Rich has saved me. And, and you know what? It would have been nice if maybe Rich made a the winery to share these with us. Um, you know, there are picnic tables here and we could have socially distanced and had uh, had some of your famous ribs. How's it going? Um, I hate to say, but this is one of the times I, I like social distancing because I get to eat most of the ribs. Um, they're wow. done. I'm just starting to cut them now. I think Laura can catch a good shot of them. Um, they'll be really ready. Okay, well, we're not getting a super clear shot, but what I'm seeing looks pretty good. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's looking good. It's there, and uh, let me know when you're leaving, and I'll pop open that bottle. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, okay, that's good. Anything else you want to say before we sign off, Rich? I'm just glad everybody's... Uh, tuned in. I, I think what we ought to do is really focus on Winston Hill and some cooking up here, maybe some, some, fun, some fun like that, or maybe show off the vineyards a little bit and uh, the next time we do this, or maybe I think the next time we're doing bubbles, but after that, we should uh, come back here and uh, do some more fun things back here. Okay, well, Rich, hang on a second. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can get off the shot but if you want, but you can also stay tuned because we have a minute here and we just launched our poll and we have a few questions and um first question is we love our wine club family who's a frank family wine club member that's watching and the second question is should rich get his own cooking show what do you think of that idea i think you were better on the show with nash last night oh i don't know about that of the three wines we tasted today which do you prefer and let's see who was paying attention. Where is our Winston Hill Vineyard located? And the other question, who's joining us next Saturday for our sparkling wine tasting? So um, for those of you who are at home, uh, it would be great if you would participate in our poll and we'll get to the, uh, get to the poll in a couple of minutes. Um, Todd and Corey, uh, I have someone asking about the Petite Verdot and we use that as a blending rate. There's a question um, whether we would consider making a Petite Verdot as its own varietal, and that's tricky. Can you answer that? Um, you guys, maybe Corey will after I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's, to me, it's a- you Make pretty, it sound like I'm pushing you in front of a bus soon. <laughs> uh, to, I don't walk in front of you in the parking lot. Uh, See? Yeah, uh, so- <laughs> Smart. Uh, um, Smart. Yeah, Petit Verdot is a very rustic grape. It, it, it's not a balanced grape, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's kind of harsh around the edges. Um, so it makes a great blending varietal. Um, so we have no intention to make a varietal Petit Verdot. At, at, and I say at this time, because uh, uh, who knows the future, but uh, we don't. The, the question also on the pulled pork um, going back is, Try the rouge. Mm. If, um, the rouge with yes. the spark. The, it's a sparkling bubbles. red, and with a pulled pork sandwich. Ah, dynamite! You know what, Todd? That's that's incredible. I never 
that never even occurred to me. And I think the rouge, I forget about that. And I forget how well that pairs with food. I always think about the rouge as a celebratory wine, something that I pull out at the holidays, um, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas. I don't think about actually pairing it with a dish. It's, it's, but that makes perfect sense, perfect sense. Um, okay, so before, uh, first of all, let's go to our poll and let's see what, oh, I'm ending the poll here. Okay, let's see what our viewers said. So we love our wine club family. Who's a Frank family wine club member who's watching today? Well, 69% of you are, are watching and 31% of you say, not yet, how can I join? How can you join? It's so simple. Go onto our website, frankfamilyvineyards.com and look at the wine club. And at that area, we will spell out all the various wine clubs that we have, whether you wanna be a bronze member, which is six bottles twice a year, a silver member, which is a case twice a year, or a gold member, which is two cases twice a year. And the various discounts are reflected in the amount of wine that you buy. But it also gives you access to some of these wines that we were talking about today. Um, the Riley, which is a, a, a red wine blend, a little bit heavier on the Merlot in that one, which is a huge fan favorite. Um, the Calistoga, the Mount Veeder, Cabernets. And we make a couple of phenomenal uh, Chardonnays that are exclusively for the wine club. So there are benefits to uh, having the membership. Should Rich get his own cooking show? 78% of you said yes. 22% said no, stick to wine. Oh, Richie. I don't know. Come on, you guys. I've tasted those ribs. They are phenomenal. Best ribs ever that he makes, okay? One so more shot. There you go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Wow. So good. So good. The key is they're moist on the inside and crispy on the outside. I don't like the ribs that like fall apart and they're like, you know, ugh, messy and all of that. I like the crispiness on the outside. And that's what you get when you add the sauce at the end and you get it nice and caramelized. And oh, it's so delicious. Okay. I'll that's the other key. Watch where you buy your ribs. If you got to get good ribs to start with, and know who you're buying from. And, right. and we're up here, we, we, um, we get ours at Sunshine, but there's, there's good ribs and then there's not so good ribs. So really take your time when you're picking them out. It's true. And, and I have a preference for the baby back ribs over the St. Louis ribs. St. Louis can be a little bit fattier and meatier, but the baby backs are just a little more lean and, and I don't know. I think they're delicious, but it's a personal, personal preference, just like wine is a personal preference. Um, I'm going to go back to our poll questions. Of the three wines that we tasted today, which do you prefer? 28% uh, said the Charles Valley Zinfandel, 32% said the RHF Cabernet, and 55% said the Winston Hill. So there is no wrong answer here. You're all right. It's what you like is what is a good wine. And the fourth question, let's see who was paying attention here. Where is our Winston Hill Vineyard located? 28% of you said Calistoga. Come on, you guys. No, we talked about the Rutherford dust, remember? The winery is in Calistoga, but the vineyards are in Rutherford. And 69% of you got that right. 5% of you said Oakville. How much wine did you guys have before you tuned in? Come on, did we even mention Oakville today? I don't think we did. Um, question five, who's joining us next Sunday for our sparkling wine virtual tasting? 53% of you said you'll be there. 47% said, I have to check my busy schedule. Well, there is still time. And if you want the wines, if you would like the wines to taste along with us, go to the website. We've got the virtual tasting package there. We have four phenomenal sparkling wines. And I know some of you are like, yeah, you know, sparkling wine, it's not my thing. Have you tasted them all? Because I believe that we can convert you. And on top of that, it's going to be a great, fun, sparkling wine tasting. And you're going to learn a few things because sparkling wine is, it's, it's intricate and it's, it's, complicated and there's so much that goes into it and it's the algebra and the science and the art and everything combined so, so i hope you'll join us for that because we're gonna be here and you know what it's only may 2nd next saturday you're not going anywhere you're gonna be sheltering in place 
Um, you really have something better to do on a Saturday at two o'clock Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern? I don't know. Drinking wine. If you don't have the sparkling, tune in anyway. We'd love to see you. We can't wait for the day that the winery is open again and we can see you here in person because we miss all of our wine club members and our guests who come through the tasting room. Um, but until then, we're going to come to you virtually and we hope that, uh, we hope that you'll join us. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the three wines. We hope you enjoyed our banter. And um, you know, this is the Zoom platform and it's not perfect and it is what it is, but it's our way of staying connected and it's our way of, of you know, reaching out to you and, and you reaching back to us and we appreciate it. So thanks for taking the hour. And thanks to my husband for making ribs. I'm going home to have some. Thanks, Todd and Corey. And we'll see you next Sunday for the virtual tasting. Thanks, everyone at home. We appreciate it. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.